Good afternoon, everyone. Good to see you all. Now, announcements before we begin. Anyone hoping to start their child in Sunday school in September, please let either me or Nan Bradford know as soon as possible. Uh, Sunday school is going to start back, God willing, on Sunday the 10th of September uh, and at 10 minutes to 11. So 10 to 11 uh, on Sunday the 10th of September. And people have been getting in touch with me about communicant membership and communicant membership classes. So again, if there's anyone looking uh, to do the classes for communicant membership, just let me know and uh, we'll be getting dates out. There's, there's plenty of interest, so we'll have dates uh, online, uh, dates coming online uh, for people. And I'll also share maybe on the Sunday School Parents WhatsApp just to remember the session's policy around communicant membership and just what's involved, and I'll, I'll send that out on the WhatsApp so people can have a, a, a look at that. Uh, other announcements then. We have our announcement sheet uh, for August, uh, and we will have on Tuesday the Tuesday evening prayer meeting and uh, Bible study here at half past eight. That's this Tuesday evening at half past eight. And just dates to bear in mind. Remember, Sunday the 3rd of September is going to be our communion service and uh, with lunch afterwards in Dara Valley Hall. So you'll not feel that coming. Uh, it's only a couple of weeks away, not even that. Like, And we are coming into the end of August already. So starting to think ahead um, into September. Well, as we come to sing our opening praise, let's first hear from God's word. Judges chapter 5 and verse 5. The mountains quaked before the Lord, the one of Sinai, before the Lord, the God of Israel. The mountains quaked before God. Will we be moved by him here today? Let's stand as we sing, Be Thou My Vision.
Before we come to confess our sins in prayer, let's be reminded of that sin from the Scripture and the words of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 43, Jesus said, You have heard it was said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Let us pray. Lord God, as we take these holy words to heart, we are conscious that there are people who have harmed us, who have hurt us, maybe even who yet harm and hurt us. And here you ask us, indeed command us, to pray for them. Lord, this can be difficult. This can be very hard for us. Lord Jesus, we remember that as you were crucified, you called on your heavenly Father to forgive those who were causing you so much pain in your crucifixion. Lord, we know we cannot forgive people unless they are truly sorry. Lord, help us to pray for people who have hurt us or harmed us that they may become truly sorry for their actions and that forgiveness can happen. Help us to pray for our enemies, not just those who love us. And help us to remember, Lord Jesus, that this is not just an option or an aspiration, but a command. Oh, Lord, what one of us would be up to it apart from your grace. Give us the grace to love all, to love others, whether friend or enemy, to pray for all, whether they wish us well or wish us harm. Lord Jesus, make us more like you, for this was your heart and is your heart, a heart of forgiveness and mercy, even towards those who hate you. Lord, make us more like you and help us to see where we fall short that we might ever seek your forgiveness and mercy. And Lord, if we're in a situation where we yet have enemies who harm us and hurt us, help us to share that with others, to seek help, to seek intervention where needed, all the while praying for conciliation and reconciliation for we place all these things before you in and through Jesus who loves us and gave himself for us. Amen. Psalm 32 and verse 7 reminds us that God is our hiding place. He is our protection. He is our deliverance. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. This is the God we worship, whose business is to hide us from even his own judgment, to protect us and deliver us, even from the consequences of our own sins. Praise be to God for his great mercy in Jesus. Well, we come to our first Bible reading this morning, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verses 12 to 13, as we look forward to our baptism today. These are verses that help us remember what baptism is according to the scriptures. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free and are all made to drink of one spirit. We praise God for this, his holy word. Children, if you want to come up to the front, you might remember I planted some seeds last week, and we were very patiently waiting for them to grow. And so let's have a look and see if anything has happened. Now, let's...
let's see, where is my pot? Would you believe, look? In one week, in one week, can you see what grew? Isn't that amazing? And those fantastic seeds that grew so quick and so lovely. What do you think? Would you like some of those seeds to grow a plant like that? Can anyone see? Is there anything maybe wrong? What's wrong? What's wrong? What's wrong with this plant? Do you think is it real? No. It ha Look, it's only a pretend plant. It has no roots. It didn't grow from those seeds I planted. It's only a pretend plant. Not like these lovely flowers here. They are real. They are real. They grew up from a little seed. But these didn't. I just got them and stuck them in the pot and pretended they were real. You know, some of us maybe once were like this. And I hope, children, you will never be like this. I was like this once where I pretended to be a Christian, but I wasn't really. I was like these plants. I was dead. There was no life in me. But I looked the part from a distance. It looked like I really believed. But you know, there was no life in me. My faith hadn't grown up from a little seed, watered with sunlight, growing with God's grace. Instead, it was all just pretend. And you know, God doesn't want us to be pretend Christians. He wants us to be the real thing, like these lovely flowers here. He wants us to have real life in us because of what Jesus has done for us and how we believe in what he has done for us. He doesn't want us to be like these dead, artificial flowers. I was an artificial Christian once. I used to pretend. I'd go to church. I'd talk about things. I'd do all the things I thought a Christian should do. But really, I was dead. Dead in my heart. Not alive at all. Until through the preaching of God's word, the seed planted in me grew. And no longer was I like this dead plant, but a real living soul saved by what Jesus had done for me. Now, it's not up to us to judge who's artificial and who's real. That's not our job. Don't worry about the person sitting beside you. Let them worry about themselves. But let's each of us be sure and examine ourselves and think, which am I not? that person over there or that person over there but me am I the real thing have I trusted Jesus for forgiveness or am I like this artificial flower just going through the motions let's take a moment to P R A Y Lord Jesus we don't want to be pretend Christians artificial Christians Lord, give us the grace by the power of your word and spirit to, to truly and really believe in what you've done for us, in what you're doing for us, and what you will do for us in the future. Help us, Jesus, to love you and trust you, to believe in you as our only Lord and Savior, and to call out to you for forgiveness for all our sins, believing that you will have for us a home in heaven. And we know, Lord Jesus, you can do this, and we pray you will do it for us. Lord, if we've been pretending, help us to stop pretending and to be honest and real. And to seek you really to be our Lord and Savior. For we ask it in your holy, precious name. And we all say, Amen. Brilliant. Well, I want you to hang on up the front here, children. Because we are going to have our baptism now. And before I ask Paul and Emma to come up, I am going to share with you uh, just a wee bit about what baptism is and what it involves. And I'll share with you what we have here on the screen. In summarizing the scripture, in this case from Matthew's Gospel and 1 Corinthians, uh, our confession of faith tells us what baptism is. Baptism, and we had this reading last week from Matthew's Gospel, Baptism is a sacrament of the New Testament ordained by Jesus Christ. He commanded it. That's why we do it, because he said to do it. 
And not only for the solemn admission of the party baptized into the visible church, but also to be unto him, that's the person baptized, a sign and seal of the covenant of grace. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13, we read there, and we've read that already, how we're all baptized into one body. When we're baptized, we're baptized into the visible church. Whether we're alive or dead, we're baptized to become members outwardly of the visible church. Whether we've yet trusted Jesus or not, we are made part of the church so that we might grow up like a seed into that faith. Children, we don't want to treat you like little pagans. We want to teach you about Jesus from the earliest time and to include you in the life of the church from the earliest time in your life. And that's why you're baptized into this fellowship of believers. We don't leave you on the outside. We bring you in so that we're all one body. And our hope and prayer is that as you grow and as you learn, that you will grow and learn into the life of the church and into salvation from the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what's meant by the covenant of grace. It's a sign and seal to the covenant of the covenant of grace. All the wonderful things Jesus has done for us. Here's a great way to think what grace means, children. G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense. That because of what Jesus has done, we can enjoy God's blessings and riches and we trust and believe in him for that. So Paul and Emma, if you'd like to bring Tom up, we'll come now to our baptism. Now, first of all, we have our baptismal vows where I have questions for Paul and Emma and then important question for the congregation too. And just like last week, we'll all remain seated and when we come to the vow that you will take as a congregation, we will all stand. So, Paul and Emma, in presenting this child for baptism, are you affirming your belief in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Depending on the grace of God, are you trusting in Jesus Christ alone as your Savior from sin and Lord of your life? Next we have the question, are you committed to living as a follower of Jesus Christ, led and empowered by the Holy Spirit? And are you willing to provide a Christian home and bring up your child in the worship and teaching of the church so that he may come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And that's what we talked about, about our children growing up in the, in the covenant of grace and coming to faith one day themselves. And now if we all stand for uh, an important vow and only answer this, yes, if it is your heart and mind for Tom. As we receive Tom into the fellowship of the church, do you promise with God's help to be faithful in prayer spiritual nurture, Christian example, and influence for him and his family. Well, all of us haven't taken our vows and promises solemnly uh, before God. We come now to our baptism. So if you want to bring Tom over here. Tom Niblock, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and abide in you forever. Well, let's sing, as is our practice, to Tom the words of the ironic blessings. The, the ironic blessing, the, this, these words are thousands of years old, and God's people have blessed each other with them through not only generations and centuries, but millennia. Let's sing the words of the ironic blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face
Let's pray for this family. Almighty and eternal God, we thank you that in your infinite mercy and goodness, you've promised not to be only our God, but also the God and Father of our children. And we thank you for receiving Tom by baptism into the life of your church. Guard and guide him all his days. May your love hold him. May your truth guide him. May your joy delight him. May he grow strong in body and mind and come to faith in Jesus as Lord and Savior. Make his home a place of safety and security, a place where he is, where he is taught your truth and led in your way. Indeed, Lord, we pray for every family in our congregations. May you be cherished in all our homes. May your presence in our midst change our lives. And may all our children grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. For it is in his name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Okay, children, I'll let you all go back to your seats. The helplessness of the child as they are baptized reminds us of uh, that kernel of the gospel that while we were dead in our trespasses and sins, Christ did what was necessary for our salvation. You know, Jesus didn't ask our permission to die for us. He just did it. Let's sing now a hymn that confesses our helplessness, our weakness, and our need for Jesus. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. We stand as we sing.
while we've been going through Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, uh, the whole letter, and we pick up this week where we left off last week in verse 19. I'm going to read today uh, verses 19 to 23. And remember as we read this, you've heard me say this many a time, but it bears repeating. This is not a horoscope. This is an apostle writing in the first century. We can't just lift what's said here and apply it directly to us without first figuring out, right, Paul was an apostle. He lived 2,000 years ago. What, what did that mean to him in that day? Then we can figure out what God would say to us through it. This is God's word. I am a free man, nobody's slave. But I make myself everybody's slave in order to win as many people as possible. While working with the Jews, I live like a Jew in order to win them. And even though I myself am not subject to the law of Moses, I live as though I were when working with those who are in order to win them. In the same way, when working with Gentiles, I live like a Gentile outside the Jewish law in order to win Gentiles. This does not mean that I don't obey God's law. I am really under Christ's law. Among the weak in faith, I become weak like one of them in order to win them. So I become all things to all people, that I may save some of them by whatever means possible. All this I do for the gospel's sake, in order to share in its blessings. And we thank God for this is holy word. Let's pray as we come to think about God's word. Lord, we do thank you for your holy word and we pray but that, that by the power of your Holy Spirit we would be enabled to take it to heart, to hear your voice speaking to us in it and also to be enabled to line ourselves up with it for Christ's sake and in his power. For we ask it in his name. Amen. If we think about the first verse we read, as I said, we have to think about this in context. Paul lived in a world where not everybody was free. He lived in a world where slavery was an everyday thing and where many members indeed of his congregations were slaves. Paul wasn't only a free man, he was a Roman citizen. He was free, as free as you could possibly be in his society. And he says, for though I be free from all, yet I've made myself a slave unto all, that I might gain more. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean that Paul went around and cleaned everyone's house every week? Cooked their meals? Did everything that needed to be done for them like a slave? Or is he using this as a picture of his mindset? Well, let, let's let him tell us himself what this looked like. And to the Jews, I became as a Jew that I might gain the Jews. Well, that wasn't hard for Paul because he was a Jew. And Jewishness wasn't just his religion, but his culture. So it was very easy for him to be like a Jew around Jews. It was what he grew up with. But he had changed. He had met Jesus and he was no longer practicing Old Testament religion. He was now under the New Covenant. Yet to those still under the Old Covenant law, who had yet to trust in Christ, he could be with them what he once was, in order that he might gain them. To them that are under the law, he was as one under the law, that he might gain them that were under the law. Now, in all of this, we need to not just take a verse. You know, most of the wrong ideas in Christianity come from someone taking one verse and running with it and not thinking about what the rest of the Bible says. So, let the whole Scripture speak to us. How did Paul act and live as a Jew among Jews? How did he behave with his uh, Jewish brothers and sisters, those with whom he shared a culture, a religion. He knew exactly what it was like 
and he was trying to appeal them to move from Moses to Christ, to move from old covenant to new. Now, did that mean, does Paul mean here that he has been nice to everyone, that he never says uh, anything that anyone might be offended by, that he is a doormat, a pushover, just in the hope that through him being nice, people might come to believe in Jesus. Well, what does the Bible say? Galatians chapter 5, 11 to 12. Paul is writing here to a church where there are Jews and Gentiles, and there were Jewish people trying to say that all Christians should be under the Old Testament Jewish law. And here's what Paul says. This would have been read publicly in church. Brothers and sisters, if I'm still preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished. As for those agitators, I wish they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. So Paul is saying something here that's quite harsh, that is not nice, but it needs to be said because of the seriousness of what people were doing. The Jews to whom he was trying to become like the Jews were then taking that inch he'd given them and taking a mile and saying everyone should be a Jew. Gentiles should be circumcised and be like us. Everyone has to be like us. And Paul, the seriousness of this was something that Paul had to underline by speaking harshly. So you can see that being a Jew to the Jews isn't just going along to get along, but speaking up where things need to be said, even when it's another apostle that's involved. Galatians chapter 2, when Cephas, now Cephas is Peter's Greek name, when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. So Peter, another apostle, Paul publicly opposes him to his face. This is how Paul lived as a Jew among Jews, slave of all. This is how it looked in his life. Next verse, uh, or in verse 14 in the same chapter, when I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, that's Peter, in front of them all, publicly, you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? So, Paul says, among the Jews, live like a Jew. You know, don't put obstacles in people's ways. If you can, you know, fit in with people, fit in with them, but not at the expense of the gospel. When the gospel is compromised, Paul has no problem in public, in front of a whole congregation, publicly berating and rebuking another apostle, Peter. Such is the seriousness of the truth of the gospel. It trumps everything. Everything must bow the knee to it. Now, these are examples, exceptions that prove the rule. Paul wasn't going around rebuking everybody or being using harsh words with everyone. He lived like a Jew among the Jews that he might win the Jews. But when something needed to be said, it was said. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 21. To those without the law, so people who weren't Jewish, pagan, Greeks, and Romans, to those without the law, I became as one without the law, being not without law to God, but under law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without the law. What did this look like in Paul's life? Did it mean that he just went along with everything that the pagans, Romans, and Greeks were doing? Well, let's look at the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 16, where Paul found himself not only among Gentiles, but imprisoned by them, imprisoned for preaching the gospel. And you might remember the story of the Philippian jailer, the earthquake comes, the jailer releases them, the jailer becomes saved, him and his whole family are baptized, and then the jailer says to Paul, the magistrates have ordered that you and Silas be released. Now you can leave, go in peace. And did Paul say, thank you, I don't want to be any more trouble, I'll just go on my way? No, he did not. As a Roman citizen, verse 37, 
Paul said to the officers, they bet us publicly without a trial, even though we're Roman citizens and threw us into prison. And now do they want to get rid of us quietly? No. Let them come out themselves and escort us out. Now, Paul wasn't just going along to get along here. When his rights, when his civil liberties and rights were breached, he stood up to that. He didn't just take it, and rightly so. Now, he didn't push the whole way. If Paul had wanted, he could have, report, he could have reported these magistrates to the emperor, and it wouldn't have been good for them. He didn't go that far. He said, let them at least come here themselves and apologize and escort us out, and still they would have been getting off lightly. So you can see when Paul says he was the slave of all, and all things to all men, it didn't mean that he became everyone's doormat and a pushover. Writing to a church that was a mix of Gentiles and Jews, he says this about Gentiles, Romans 1, 21. For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him, but their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. This is what Paul says about pagans. There would have been people sitting in the congregation listening to that who were once pagans. He's talking about them. And they would have said, Amen, he's right. My foolish heart was darkened. I didn't give thanks to God or glorify him, but praise be to God, I, through what Jesus has done for me, I now do believe my heart is no longer dark. My thinking is no longer futile because someone like Paul had the courage to tell me I was wrong and dead in my trespasses and sins. You see, the gospel is not good news unless you first hear the bad news that anyone without Christ their thinking about spiritual things is futile and our foolish hearts are darkened. Verse 22 then, Paul says, to the weak, I became as the weak, that I might gain the weak. Now, it doesn't say weak in faith. It says weak. I became all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. And here, as I read and studied this during the week, this is the verse where for me, the penny dropped. That Paul was speaking here about how Jesus had made him like himself. How Jesus had made Paul like Jesus. Because this is what Jesus did. To us, the weak, Jesus became as the weak that he might gain the weak. Jesus, true God, became truly a man. Was born into a weak human body like ours, exactly like us in every way except sin. Suffered the pain and anguish and misery of human life. Why? For us, that by becoming weak, he might save the weak. Paul is living like Jesus. Look what he says in 2 Corinthians 8, 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Jesus became like us. And so Paul became like the Old Testament Jews. Paul became like the Gentiles. Paul became like the weak. He fitted in. Yes, I've given you examples to show that this did not mean being a doormat. This did not mean being a, a pushover. But yet, we know that he did his best to get on with all kinds of people. At no point looking down his nose at them. At no point thinking he as a Jew was superior to the Gentiles. At no point thinking that he as a New Testament believer was somehow superior to his Old Testament Jewish brothers and sisters who had yet to come to faith. Paul knew that he had nothing in himself that he could boast of. That God didn't love him because he was good enough or because he was kind of a step above everyone else. 
that he needed the gospel as much as they did. As one missionary put it, Paul was like a beggar showing other beggars where to find bread. And this, in verse 23, he says, and this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might share in it with you. How can we apply this to ourselves? The broad brush stroke, the broad brush stroke principles here are that our culture, how we live out our lives, especially as Christians, shouldn't put obstacles in other people's ways. I, I, I took an opportunity to communicate this to people once. I remember we, we all had a good laugh about it. But, you know, it just I, I had been thinking about how people often say, oh, I'm a Christian, I don't do that, or I'm a Christian, I don't do this. And it just communicates an air of superiority, and I'm morally better than you. I'm superior to you because I'm a Christian and you're not, and I'd never do that thing you're doing. And yet, it's just culturally determined rather than anything we find in Scripture. When I was an assistant in Greenwell Street in Newton Arts, the girls' brigade leaders were having a meeting, uh, and they all gathered in, and uh, it was in the evening time, and they'd all got lovely cakes and buns and pastries, and they had tea and coffee, and they were having a great chat all together before they had their meeting. And I was at a meeting upstairs, and I came down the stairs, and uh, the, the GB, the local GB captain, who I knew very well and got on with very well, says, come on and, and, and meet all these people here and introduce me as the assistant, new assistant. I was only arrived there. And uh, they said, have, have a bun, have a pastry, have a cake. And I, deadly serious, said, oh, I don't eat them things. I'm a Christian. And they all looked at me, not knowing what to say. And then I just burst out laughing. And we all had a great laugh. And we talked then about how, you know, Christians, some, Christians can sometimes get these notions that there's things Christians do or don't do where the Bible says nothing about it. That's not being all things to all men. That's actually even making Christianity into something it's not. It's an obstacle to the gospel. Whatever cultural things that we do or don't do, let them be cultural things. Realize they're not spiritual things. Let not culture be an obstacle to the gospel. Because the gospel was everything to Paul. He could leave his Jewish culture aside. He could live a foreign Gentile culture, all for the sake of the gospel. Because remember what we saw last week, 1 Corinthians 9, 16. For when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast, since I'm compelled to preach. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. And in preaching the gospel, Paul wanted to be as Christ-like as God gave him the grace to be. And let's remember once more what that's like from Philippians chapter 2. Paul, to the weak, he became like the weak because Jesus made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a slave, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death even death on a cross. Earlier on, I challenged you to think, are you an artificial plant or a living plant? Are you a pretend Christian or a real one? No one can decide that for you. Only you in your own heart know. And how you can know is, what you feel inside you in response to this gospel, that Jesus took on our nature for the sake of our salvation, that he even died on a cross so that our sins might be forgiven. Is that everything to you? Is that all you depend on for your standing before God? That's what it's like to be a, a living plant. Pretend Christians are concerned with all the do's and don'ts and the cultural things around Christianity. But the living plant, the real saved person, it's all about the gospel and precious little else. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 3. How shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation?
Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we praise you and adore you that you became like us to save us. That you took on our frail human nature, suffering pain and anguish, distress and agitation, indeed suffering more than any other person who has ever lived, all to win our salvation on the cross and by our resurrection, conquering death for us. Oh Lord, we thank you for your life-giving spirit through whom we are able to become living stones in your temple. Lord, if we think to ourselves that we may just be artificial, would you take away our heart of stone and give us a heart of flesh? Would you give us true faith in Christ? Lord, you became weak to rescue us, the weak. Help us to realize today our absolute dependence on you for everything. For we ask it in your holy and precious name. Amen. Well, let's sing our closing hymn. This, the words of this hymn reflect really what we've been thinking about, that it's not anything in us, it's not in our own strength, our own ability, it's not our own good enoughness that reconciles us to God, but only what Christ has done for us in becoming weak, that he might save us the weak. Let's stand as we sing in Christ alone.
34 to 36. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counsellor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. And in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore.